as was explained to you, this is not an account of the crisis. You've probably seen or at least had the chance to read any number of accounts of the crisis. And the only accurate account will be written many years into the future by an historian who has the opportunity to go through all the papers and can write dispassionately about the events that occurred. And all my papers will be available to such historians. So it's not an account, and it's not a memoir either, because I think, um, as a participant, you cannot write objectively about your own part in it. <coughs> so what I wanted to write was something rather different. <coughs> and it was something inspired by a remark of my opposite number in China. When I, I went to China, and uh, the, you probably know that the, the favorite sport of the elite in China is tennis. And they take it very seriously. And I was invited to play tennis as a means of avoiding yet another interminable international meeting. And we played in the, um, in the state guest house, where the facilities, I must say, would put not only Flushing Meadow, but Wimbledon to shame. Uh, wonderful dressing room, and we had a banquet afterwards. And there were just four of us having dinner. And I got rather carried away, probably. But I said to, it, to my opposite number, I said, well, you will recall the remark attributed to Chow En Lai, who, when asked about the French Revolution, uh, was alleged to have said, although Henry Kissinger subsequently denied it, but alleged to have said, French Revolution, too soon to tell. And um, so I wanted to ask my colleague about what his view was about the Industrial Revolution, where mankind had basically existed at the same standard of living for you know a thousand or more years, and in the mid-18th century, the Industrial Revolution began in my country. It then expanded to the rest of the world, and particularly in the late 19th century to the United States, which then took on the mantle of being the most advanced economy. And ever since then, even though productivity growth, say 2% a year, may not seem very dramatic, over 100 years, it can more than increase living standards by tenfold. So this truly was a revolutionary development. So what was his view from China? After all, 500 years ago, China had been the most prosperous and successful country in the world. And he said to me, he said, well, we're very interested in the Industrial Revolution. We've studied it very carefully. And we think that the benefits of competition and a market economy have a great deal to offer in terms of raising living standards and boosting productivity. And we want to emulate that. <clears throat> And then he paused, and he looked at me with a sort of twinkle in his eye, and he said, I'm not quite sure that you in the West have quite got the hang of money and banking yet. And what he meant, of course, was that these periods of tremendous prosperity and rapid growth had been interspersed at frequent intervals by crises of both money and banking. This was the bit of a market economy that we hadn't really got the hang of yet. And he's right. And... If you think about it, of the great hyperinflations in history, the two biggest were in the past 60 years. So this is not looking back 100, 200 years and saying, oh, those fuddy-duddies in the past, obviously they made a mess of it. They would, wouldn't they? But we are modern people, we wouldn't do this. Actually, it's recent experience. And the banking crisis of 2008 was the biggest, in my judgment, the biggest financial crisis the world has ever seen. So these are still with us if anything, on an ever-increasing scale. So why, why is that? And that's what the spirit of the book is about. It's about economic ideas, and in large part it's explaining why economics has taken, if not a false turn in the last 50 or 60 years, at least it's made a mistake by economists pretending that they can be like physicists and mathematicians, dealing with laws of nature that are unchanging, but we can discover them over time, where there is no need to worry about the interaction between people within the economy, and where you can write down computer models, and this will help you not only to understand what's going on, but to predict the future. And if you look at meteorologists, it is true in meteorology that as computing power gets bigger and bigger, weather forecasts get more and more accurate, because they are dealing with laws of nature. It is simply not true that as computing power gets bigger and bigger, and economists' computer models also get bigger and bigger, that their ability to forecast improves. It doesn't. 
and it's not a at all clear to me that we're any, in any better position to predict the future now than we were 50 or 100 years ago.